Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this second episode of our three-part series, or sorry, first episode of this three-part series, the Reputation Management Playbook, Turning Every Customer Interaction into Your Competitive Advantage, presented by B2B Marketing Zone and sponsored by Reputation. I'm Tom, the webinar coordinator for B2B Marketing Zone, and I'm excited to bring you this fresh session with hard-earned insight about how uh, negative reviews and online feedback happens. So where do you go from here? I'm really looking forward today to talking with Adam Dorfman and Jeremy Schubitz in what I'm sure will be a fascinating and amusing conversation. Also, we will be recording this webinar in case you have to leave early. We're gonna be sending the link to the series page in the chat box right now. Alrighty, up next, let's get some technical things out of the way. Please feel free to ask questions during today's session. You can do so by submitting them into the questions panel on the right side of your screen. Don't forget to stick around to the end for our Q&A session to get even more fresh insights from Adam and Jeremy. My wonderful colleague Michelle here will also be fielding your questions today. She'll be happy to answer anything you might have, so feel free to pull up the questions panel and you can just say hello to let her know that you're listening. Lastly, if you have any audio issues during today's presentation, you may wish to choose to dial in by phone. You can do so by selecting the more button in the upper right portion of your screen and then selecting the switch to phone option. Alrighty, up next, Today I'm talking to Adam Dorfman and Jeremy Schubitz. Adam is a technology and digital marketing professional with more than 20 years of experience. His expertise spans all aspects of product development as well as scaling product and engineering teams. He has been in the SEO and local SEO space since 1999. In 2006, Adam co-founded Sim Partners and helped create a business that made it possible for companies to automate the process of attracting and growing customer relationships across multiple locations. Sim Partners was acquired by Reputation in 2018, and now Adam is currently Director of Product at Reputation, where he and his teams are integrating location-based marketing with reputation management and customer experience. And now Jeremy Schubitz at Bosley. Jeremy oversees and participates in the development and execution of highly accountable marketing efforts for the acquisition, retention, and re-engagement of prospective and existing patients, set strategy for television, radio, SEO, SEM, online, social, paid and organic, direct mail, SMS influencer and mail, as well as for the website, e-commerce and creative development from brief through production across TV, radio, print, digital, and in-office signage and collateral. So it's a lot of things that he does. He also manages customer experience programs, including survey development, platform onboarding, and reporting. So without further ado, take it away, Adam and Jeremy. Thank you, and thank you for joining everybody. It's great to, to have you all here. Uh, and thank you, Jeremy, too, of course, for, for participating as well. Um, quick, to, like, quick overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, so we're gonna be speaking about where do customers go for feedback, uh, how to monitor and manage that feedback, especially when it's coming in the form of reviews. Uh, and really the key takeaways, it's gonna get very tactical. Um, we have eight golden nuggets on what to happen when negative reviews come in, because those can be challenging no matter how big or small your business is. And no matter how big or small or successful your business is, you are gonna encounter those from time to time. And then finally, um, we're gonna spend some time talking about how to enable your customer support team. Jeremy in particular has a lot of uh, experience with that and uh, can really speak to some fantastic examples. So I'm excited to get to that part as well too. Okay, so let's get started with the power of feedback. Um, when I think of uh, my time here at Reputation and what I've learned since being acquired by them uh, a few years ago, um, it's really just, how powerful it is not just to be found, which is uh, where my head was at for 20 years or so. Um, how can I become more visible on Google and on Bing? And how can I get people to click to my website more? And what other growth hacking methods can I use and so on? Um, what I really have come to realize over the last three or four years is that the power of that feedback that exists is um, incredibly important and it's everywhere as well too. And Jeremy, I think you, you've you noticed the same thing um, uh, in your career also. Um, is there anything you'd wanna add to that? Yeah, and uh, thank you again for inviting me here today. Um, yeah, feedback, uh, customer experience has been a major part of uh, just the development of Bosley throughout the years. Bosley is an aesthetics medicine. I think it's important that I clarify what Bosley is first for those who may not know. Um, but we provide hair restoration. 
services, uh, from surgery to topicals and other products. And in our space, the consumer is private. It's something that they, they do for themselves, but they don't necessarily want to share. So well, as we talk about feedback, it's going to be, you know, getting that feedback is sometimes more difficult because people are less willing to share. So they'll share maybe with us, but they won't share publicly. And times are changing and evolving. So Bosley has always put customer feedback as a priority and they, uh, long before my time, I mean, of their 45 years in existence, I can't say how many, but uh, surveys and internal feedback has just been, you know, uh, a focus of collection for them. And, you know, I think it's important that they have a philosophy, which, you know, embodies their, you know, our, you know, our everyday purpose, which is just to provide patients a great experience. And I think is if you have a philosophy or a, a mantra or whatever you want to, you know, a credo that you believe in, but, you know, we believe in our products, right, in our services, and of course, our team members are the most integral part of, of our success. And if, you know, you go forward with the belief in your products and services, you know, the feedback and uh, communication that surrounds that, you know, will flow. So feedback, it's what you get. And, and you know, we'll talk about how do we enable that, but then uh, how do we use that information? So absolutely very important. We'll get more into that as we go. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through this here, which is where are some of the places that this feedback um, might, ex you might experience this feedback. Um, and some of them are really straightforward, like uh, if you think of social media, um, Facebook and Twitter and and so on, uh, always feedback coming in on uh, in in those cases. Reviews, of course, is um, uh, a very important part of uh, the feedback channels that you can in the 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 ecosystem where feedback exists as well too. Uh, surveys. So it's one thing when customers go to a site like Google or TripAdvisor or uh, Yelp or what have you, where you're, where they may be choosing to actively go and and create a review. But what about the survey feedback when you're soliciting feedback directly from them? Um, there's fantastic feedback there as well too. One thing that we're seeing uh, more and more businesses focus on, and more and more trends with consumers preferring to leave feedback is with messaging. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about um, all of these things uh, later, but uh, messaging has been really interesting seeing how that's been been growing. Um, employee feedback, this is something that I'm going to speak a little bit more of in a, in a little bit, but it's interesting to, to think about feedback coming not just from your customers, but from your internal stakeholders, your internal employees as well too. And then finally, word of mouth. This is where it all began, right? Um, 50 years ago, uh, any sort of feedback that you would uh, receive or or natural organic growth that you might receive often happened from word of mouth and you had to have your ear uh, to the ground, so to speak. That's still the case today. Um, so much uh, happens in channels that are not necessarily consumable, but if you try and uncover that, there's there's certainly um, data to be, to be mined there as well too. Okay, so let's focus in on a couple of these. Um, first, it's going to be prompted surveys. So surveys, uh, you know, they typically don't uh, account for a huge percentage of the total amount of feedback data that you have, but it's oftentimes the best way to get feedback data um, right after some sort of customer experience happens. And I know, Jeremy, you have some thoughts uh, related to this. Um, could you share uh, what your uh, the, how you how you've used surveys up until this point? Sure. You know, all, all feedback is a blessing, right? And and a curse because you have to manage it, but it's a blessing. And you know, this uh, you know the feedback that you get, you know, you can channel. It doesn't. Okay. So from your first interaction with the customer, really all the way through the process, we survey. Uh, our customers, you know, how was their consultation? How was your procedure? How was the staff? How was the services? What are your expectations? Were you communicated with? We ask lots of different questions. We try to keep it as short as possible, but we, you know, those questions that we ask were targeted towards, you know, things we want to know, right? They should be actionable questions that you can, you know, implement uh, that feedback. And I think that's the most important part. So, uh, as I said before, it's private. Our, for us, you know, maybe 50% of our, our feedback actually comes from our surveys. So surveys for us are very, very important. And 
you know, it's the it's the it's the business's job to to collect that feedback. This is your opportunity to gather whatever you want to know about uh, your business, right? Areas that you know you hear you hear voices, you hear uh, in, by reading you know, you know other chatter that's out there. So you can ask questions. You can be more pointed. And if you need to adjust those questions on your feedback, I would say do it. You know, evolve that survey over time to adapt to what you need to know and where you think you need to improve and what you're hearing out in the field. So um, overall, you know, it's that's your database, right? And use email, SMS, uh, telephone, your in-person conversations, whatever it may be, but use all those channels to collect that feedback. And so collecting the feedback and developing the survey actually is pretty much the easiest part, right? But taking that to heart, taking that and making you know, understanding what it means to your business and then implementing those changes, that's that's really the difficult part. Um, and the negativity, you know, for Bosley, just quickly, um, you know, I'll get into some counts of what we do get, but but we try to respond to everything and especially the negatives. Awesome, thanks, Jeremy. That's, that's super uh, insightful and, and helpful. Okay, um, we also want to talk about unsolicited feedback, which uh, could be uh, feedback that comes from uh, review channels and places where people are just going and leaving that feedback that you're not even asking for. So surveys is really helpful, but a lot of the best feedback that you're gonna are are going to receive is not necessarily from uh, or not necessarily at the times that you're actually asking for it. So it's super important to to consider that as well. Um, oh, sorry. And Jeremy, you were gonna you were gonna go through some examples of where that might happen on some some review sites here. Can you can you talk through some of these with us? Absolutely. I think you know you heard my background covers a lot of different things in in you know, media, advertising, and and the gamut of marketing. But you know back in the day, it was you know there were companies that would try to promote word of mouth, and you know how could you get that one to one communication? And you know this these you know google reviews and it's it's the best form of communication this is unsolicited it's uh influential and it's really it's a foundation that you know convinces customers to you know either engage or not engage uh in this example we have our kansas city office and uh we do enable review gathering um, but uh, I'm not necessarily expecting you to read it all, but I'm just going to highlight made me feel comfortable, great care, uh, explaining, friendly and helpful, exceptional service, interaction one another, and the best interest at heart. So uh, Kansas City is fantastic. Gabe, Tasha, and the rest of the team, you know, they, they really know what they're doing. They care about their customers, um, and it's always about just how to make a positive impact, uh, you know and give everybody the best service. So I think without you know understanding, collecting, and, and gathering this feedback, Kansas City would just be a great office. They're doing well. Most of our offices do well. Um, you know, we we know our pain points and we'll get to one of them, you know, but I'm not gonna air my diary to you, Andre, either, right? That's internal. But uh, but you know, without having review management and collecting feedback and understanding it, uh, you know, we wouldn't be able to make internal uh, improvements. So KC has become, you know, management recognizes the positivity that's out there and this experience. They're not just meeting their numbers, they're exceeding them. So they became a training office for us. Tasha, our office manager, uh, actually she's, a, sorry, the counselor, she's become a regional supervisor. Um, you know, this has become a model office that shares their, their, their patterns, their behavior, their their responses, how they deal with customers, and you know spreads that through. Bosley does have seven, more than seventy locations throughout the United States, so um, I can get into headcounts. But uh, again, uh, this has become a model office that shares what they know and how they interact with customers. So I think it's important that management recognizes you know what's going on here and rewards that and rewards it by both you know making them the model. And then, uh, you know, the example, and so that'll help the business flourish. Okay. Um, on the next slide, uh, we do talk about, you know, the negativity. It's kind of why we're all here. Like, what happens when you get negative feedback? You know, what do you do with it? And it's easy to, well, you can't hide this one. This is a Facebook review, uh, you know, but you can't necessarily hide your feedback all the time. There are times you can, and we'll get into that. Uh, but it's important. It's important to recognize your shortcomings. What 
you failed at and how you can change. Now, in terms of responding and what your public face is and, and how you do that, you know, I think it's it's take ownership, uh, definitely, and, and try to, you know, alleviate the situation, show that you care. Um, and, and, you know, at, whether or not, you know, Don becomes a patient or not, sorry, Don, um, I don't know him, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we dropped the ball twice on this guy and there's no excuse for that. And I did hear a story. I don't think it was this guy, Don, but it was somebody else that we dropped the ball on. And, you know, after making a contact with them, they ended up actually becoming a patient. Okay. So we were able to remedy these situations. So, you know, we put co personal contact information. We don't always put that phone number there. That is a regional supervisor. Sometimes we say contact us. Sometimes we can identify the person and we may reach out on our own. But, you know, all negative review, all negative feedback, we do take a proactive stance on that and respond to 100% of it and try to remedy every situation. But remedy a situation means changing your process. Now, COVID hit. And we switched to video consultations back in, you know, a year ago, April or a year and a half ago. And that was new for us. So we're adapting and we're still learning and we're trying to adjust our business for the current times. So we know we're not perfect and we're still not perfect today. And I think, you know, recognizing that, recognizing your shortcoming and taking steps to improve it and then figure out how to deal with that feedback or, uh, you know, is important. We have canceled consultation surveys for missed, no shows, try to understand why they didn't show or we didn't contact them. Um, and then we take all the public data as well and we contact everybody when we can. So that's great. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, okay. All right. So social media comments, um, uh, social media comments here. Um, those can be incredible. We just saw a couple examples of those, um, and I know uh, um, Jeremy, you had a like you had a really good example here as well too that you wanted to share. Oh well, okay, yeah, ex example. I'm not sure if exactly that, but you know, I, we love seeing the banter. We love, oh, I think it was about uh, the person that ended up becoming in. They wrote a message to us and said, you know, I got stood up, and that was an inbox message and not on social media. That person became the the actual customer. Very similar to Don, but but this one was on social media. Um, you know, the interaction and the banter on social media, it's fantastic. I mean, this is really an area where uh, the eyeballs are there. Now, we spend money on advertising because we're consumer facing, uh, direct response. We want engagement. Um, some of you guys might be more B2B, but the same tenants hold true, right? You post ads on LinkedIn or on social media. Um, you know, you're putting yourself out there, whether they're ads or just organic comments on organic, you know, ads or or just the page in general. Um, you know, the, the interaction and the banter is great, but sometimes they can get out of control. And this is like just a free for all. Right. And then and social media is like immediate. I mean, this is something you can control. Honestly, you do have time to respond. Um, but but, you know, in social media. It can turn destructive. It can turn inappropriate. Um, some of the comments. So I think some of the good rules on social media are let conversation flow. Let consumers be consumers. Let people have fun with, uh, you know, your ads with it. Because any publicity is good publicity to a point. Okay. Um, but things that are destructive. I use the word fud. It's the one I learned only back in May. If that says something to anybody on this call, right? Uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's a crypto term. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, you, you really have the right. I mean, if it's your channel and, and, you, and you have the ability to remove some of these things that are detrimental or destroying your business, you know, in the social world, I think it's appropriate that you can remove some of that. Be careful of spammers. Be careful of hijackers. You know, we have hair salons that piggyback on our on our ads, right? Because we're spending a lot of money on it, right? And they're just like, hey, check me out, you know? And, you know, that's not right, right? Hide, delete those things. Things that are destructive to your business, you can remove. Things that are fun and playful or positive, you can keep. Uh, neutral, you can, you can keep. But what the real thing here is that 
It's an opportunity to provide learnings, feedback, answer questions, engage consumers. And the great news is that you can track all this, right? Whether we use you know, UTM parameters, special phone numbers, whatever it is, you know, try to track, try to understand where, uh, you know, where the activity is, where it's coming from and, and what, you know, your lead source is, whether you ask them at the back end or you're tracking it along the front end. So that's right. We proactively track everything and, you know, social media could be the most challenging uh, area in general, you know. That's so. great, Jeremy. Thank you. And I love that example of uh, hair salons um, piggybacking, uh, assuming that it's going to be a, a successful procedure that whatever is, is happening and, and all that. So that's that's fantastic. That's uh, in, I can imagine that's annoying, but in some ways that also speaks to the quality of the services that you're providing as well, too. Yeah, you have competitors that do it, too. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Well, that I that that we're all aware of. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to move on. Um, okay. So Google business listings, just briefly here, uh, the way that at reputation we see Google, it's essentially your digital front door. That's how we refer to it here. And that's uh, when you think of how any customer or consumer is interacting with your brand, most often for the first time today, it's when they do a search and they see um, uh, and they see your business information there. So making sure that you are have as complete um a representation of who you are as a business as a brand on google is incredibly important and uh, whether that's with reviews or your business listing information questions and answers videos scheduling there's so much that you can do there these days um, and it's incredibly important that you're managing all of that and that you're taking all of that feedback that's coming in through google which is massive um, and listening to that as well too yeah, I don't have much to add here, but Google for us is uh, the best far, by far the best lead. It converts about four times uh, the rate of any other lead. I would say just make sure your Google listings, your Google My Business is up to date. It is your front door. Everybody uses it. Don't deny it. Awesome. Awesome, Jeremy. Um, four times is a huge stat, too, that it converts that much faster. That speaks to, again, why Google is where they are today. Uh, when people are actively searching for your brand, that's when you want to That's when you want to appear. Okay. Um, in real time, so this is referring to messaging, which I mentioned earlier. And again, just seeing how Google and Apple Maps and Siri are pushing so many uh, interactions now and Facebook, of course, too, so that customers, even if they want to call you, they might be prompting them, would you like to start a chat conversation instead? Should a business have that enabled? It really speaks to how um, a lot of these large companies, technology companies, social media listings and so on see messaging. And the way that they see it is that it's gonna be very important and that their searchers and their users want to have messaging conversations with these businesses there as well too. So if this is, if you think of crawl, walk, run, this is definitely along the run spec, like in terms of all the things that you could be doing right now. Um, and if you haven't enabled this yet, you're not alone. Um, but it's something maybe to start thinking about. And Jeremy, have you started thinking about this yet? Or where are you at with messaging? So we monitor over 2,000 social comments uh, a month, 200 third party reviews, 600 internal surveys. And uh, you know, it, it, for us, we're fortunate to have a, a deep bench. We've gotten our response time down from, you know, a day or two down to three and a half hours. But it's not something, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that. I think you got to make it part of your daily routine. You got to know where you're going to look, prioritize the platforms. But, um, you know, is automation the next frontier? Is AI the next frontier? Um, maybe, but. But there, you know, I think the personal touch uh, will, you know, always be important, especially yeah. when with negative reviews. That's awesome. And for everybody else listening in, I don't know if you like Jeremy's throwing out so many fantastic nuggets here right now, even before we get to the golden nuggets. But sorry, I'm just, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm just saying, like they went from a day and a half to, uh, did you say three hours? Was that? Uh, yeah, we're, we're about three and a half hours. Three and a half hours now. That's fantastic. Um, I, I mean, and that is the amount of uh, effort it takes to get there is significant. Um, but again, it can be done. Like it often can seem overwhelming and daunting when you're trying to respond to customer feedback as it comes in, no matter what the channel is. Um, and it takes work to get there. But uh, I think it's inspiring hearing how Jeremy's been able to make so much progress here. 
Okay, and there's, um, and we've mentioned a few things, but again, uh, feedback can come in all shapes and forms. If you think back to that slide, that build slide that I had where it showed all the different channels. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're thinking of that too. Okay, why is it important to manage your feedback, uh, positive or negative, as it comes in. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read through all these stats, uh, but that 22% stat of prospects look elsewhere after reading one negative review, that's, that's massive. So whatever you can do to, um, uh, one, make sure that the majority of reviews coming in, the overwhelming majority of reviews coming in are positive so that there's fewer negative ones for potential customers or prospects to come across. Um, so they're seeing the positive and setting of negative is really important, but also responding to them is really important too. Um, Jeremy, does that, does that statistic stand out to you at all or is there anything else here that you'd want to comment on? It, it does. I mean, this is your front door. Think about how many times you've been uh, looking for a restaurant and you've seen three stars or whatever, and then you go somewhere else. Uh, same with our business, right? We wanna know that the majority of people had a great customer service, and when you do read those reviews, you know, you're looking at what the meanings are behind them, whether it was, uh, um, uh, you know, sorry, <laughs> you just triggered something. Um, but, but this is your front door, you need to manage your reputation. You need to manage it because you'll lose a customer before you even make contact with a customer, right? And so it's that important that you make sure your public image is monitored, managed, and, and really shows what you do in the best light. And if it's wow. negative, you got to take, you know, <laughs> internal action to change something because, yeah. You know. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit, exactly how to take action. So that's coming up. Um, but listen, like these are reputation uh, stats, and this is coming from a automotive client we have with 50 dealership. And what we found was this client had uh, 50 business locations. They weren't managing anything as related to reviews or um, feedback or customer, you know, customer like surveys or anything along those lines. So they were, they didn't, they weren't really actively trying to manage all of these, um, all of the feedback that was coming in. And once they started to, what we saw was within a year, they saw first off a 10 times increase in review volume because they started asking for reviews. Um, the responses went way up. Uh, like they, they started responding to all reviews that came in as well too. Um, and that led to increases in visibility within Google search results, as well as an in, uh, increase in traffic from um, uh, all the clicks that they were receiving from their Google My Business uh, profiles as well too. So there's direct correlations here between actively listening to your customers, trying to improve that customer experience and making sure that as negative reviews come in that, you're, um, uh, that you are responding to them. Okay, so real quick, how do I find all of the reviews? Because they are everywhere. Um, at Reputation, we are able to monitor reviews on well over 200 um, different sites and apps at this point. Uh, so a lot of them are niche specific, um, but uh, there are many, many places. So what are some examples of some of these places that you might um, see uh, reviews? Um, the way that I like to group these is you have your primary sources, and that's really Google and Facebook. The overwhelming majority of reviews for most businesses are gonna be coming from those two places. Google specifically, I mean, Google is eating everybody else's lunch when it comes to review volume and the amount of reviews that are coming in there. Um, it's fascinating looking at trends in terms of total amount of reviews that have been coming in from Google as they like start swinging upwards exponentially versus um, directory specific sites like uh, Yelp or Yellow Pages or even niche sites like um, uh, like uh, health grades, for instance, uh, you might like we're seeing those start going down. And again, it's safe to say that the majority of those people that used to leave reviews on those niche or directory sites are now leaving them on Google and Facebook instead. So you want to make sure those, we call those primary because that's where you want to start. Um, there's secondary sites that still can generate a lot of reviews. So even though I just mentioned Yelp reviews going down, they're still collecting a decent amount of review volume and um, it's a good idea to try and keep tabs on those as well too. 
uh, and then vertical specific, which I mentioned as well. So every business vertical has niche reviews. So whether it's WebMD for healthcare, Zomato, Home Advisor, Senior Advisor, Cars.com. I mean, it just goes on and on in terms of all of the different places where reviews could exist. So make sure that you are also keeping tabs on those reviews um, as well too, and trying to find all of those niche sites uh, within your vertical. You're probably yeah. already a them, but make sure you're, you're monitoring those. And then finally, uh, the last one that I'm often thinking about are employee reviews. Uh, when we speak to clients about improving their customer experience and where to find all of the feedback coming in, the ones coming in from employee sites is fascinating. Um, first off, it tends to be from people that were really passionate about working at your organization, because if they left or if they're still there and they're unhappy, it's more often than not because they want to see the company um, succeed. They want their career to go well and they want to see your company go well, uh, the com their company go um, uh, perform well as well too. There's amazing opportunities uh, to mine things that you could be improving, uh, especially if you're in a B2B business, um, both internally that would then filter down certainly to your customers or to your users or to your consumers or patients, depending on the, the um, business that you're in. Now, Jeremy, when we were going through this and uh, uh, the slide here, you had a couple examples of ones that um, I didn't really consider and I thought were fascinating. Um, do you want to share some of those that I missed? Uh, sure. I mean, we monitor Trustpilot, Piss Consumer, BBB, you know, Better Business Bureau, uh, Hi, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, we are a reputation customer, you know, um, and you know, reputation platform definitely helps us aggregate a lot of these reviews and. For those platforms that you know either aren't tracked or you know you need to track that yeah um you know i think it's important that you use the platform to set 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 yourself up for alerts right it doesn't mean you have to aggregate and get reviews and say i need to improve my reputation on all of these sites because as as adam said right google is the is the grill in the room right we know that but every vertical has its own important site so health grades and vitals for our doctors, um, and really it's Google. You know, we focus primarily on Google, but we monitor everything. We respond across all the platforms, and you know that's important in reputation management. But you know, fortunate and and unfortunate, Google is the is the goal. You know, it makes life semi easier because you go to one stop shop, but it's everywhere, and we have a presence everywhere, and many of you do. So um, definitely put something in place to monitor all of them. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, so it is time. Without further ado, let's get into eight golden nuggets when negative reviews come your way. What do you do? How do you respond to them? And uh, what should you uh, be thinking about? So, uh, uh, number one, when responding to negative reviews, count to 10 and own up. All right, so yeah. first and foremost. <laughs> uh, this one's easy to get carried away with, right? Ahead. I mean, you know, first thing, no, I didn't do that. I didn't say that, you know, that's not what happened. Like, yeah, it may not be, but you know, there are a couple things at play here. One, the consumer feels a certain way, whether or not you offended them, you did what they said or not. The truth is, A, it's public and B, that's what they feel. So you gotta own up to that. You gotta recognize, okay, uh, maybe something happened, maybe, you know, and so you look internally, but own up, apologize, uh, you know, comment to it, but don't, you know, don't get angry, don't get defensive, and remember that this is public, everybody's going to see how you respond, so you want to keep it clean, and, you know, your ultimate goal is to change the customer's negative opinion, and or establish contact, and take it, you know, offline but uh you know show that you care right i mean that's really it right so yeah. show that you care and I, I would just add to that uh that you know it, i i picked this uh image for this one um primarily because no matter how bad and how much like jeremy said you might disagree or want to get defensive about the information coming in somebody took the time to leave you feedback so be as constructive as possible with it there's typically at at least a kernel of truth in every negative review, even if you completely disagree with it. So uh, um, take the time to do that, take a breath and figure out how uh, the best way to respond. Okay, so then what? 
Well, next one is you want to respond promptly. Um, it's incredibly important as these reviews come in that you're not waiting two weeks or two months to respond to reviews. Sometimes when we have clients come with us that have never really taken the time to have a um, review strategy whatsoever, they'll, they'll say, should we be going, like, we're all in. We want to do this. We want to make sure that we're doing best practices. Um, should we be going back and responding to every review that came in? And usually the answer that we give is if it's more than a month or so out at this point, uh, especially for negative reviews, you're probably going to just start bringing up bad feelings that maybe um, are best, best left uh, uh, sitting there. However, you do have a nice window and normally it's 48 hours, the sooner the better. So again, kudos to Jeremy for getting it down to three hours. But if you can get that response in within um, a day or two, uh, you have a very good opportunity and a really good chance to turn that customer's opinion around and potentially um, make that situation right and perhaps turn that uh, negative review into a positive one because on most of these sites, you can go in and edit re a review that you left. Okay, next, let's make it personal. So uh, when it comes to negative reviews, uh, one thing that you want to make sure that you're doing is uh, you need to find that balance between uh, making it a response that you can, where you can acknowledge that the person had a uh, bad experience and you want to make sure that it's personal and the person realizes, the reviewer realizes that you're speaking directly to them, but also finding that balance of not getting too much in the weeds, which we're, we're going to get to in a future nugget. Um, but yeah, Jeremy, how, how do you go about making it uh, uh, personal when it comes to uh, uh, when negative reviews come in? Sure. Uh, I think Shirley, our client relation and employee development manager, so Shirley helps moderate our social channels as well as our contact center personnel. And she, when I asked her, you know, this question, you know, any uh, any nuggets, any tidbits that, you know, you can share from your experience on this, she said, the one thing that's always been true, either in social media or real life situations, one of the most sincerest forms of respect is actually listening to what the other another person has to say. And so, while we might not be able to address in, in all of their issues and comments and negative experiences, you know, when they know and feel that they've been heard, it makes a difference in one way or another. They either stop posting or they talk to us to resolve the issue, right? And it's an attitude like that, you know, that 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 you know is why we love having Shirley and you know the other members of our team handling this. Um, but yeah, uh, we tr you know we'll get to it, but we we have canned responses, absolutely, but. I tried to encourage the team not to just use the canned response, but use it as a foundation. Read what they wrote, and you know, if you can research it, great. Otherwise, if it's just a, a normal response, you know, address the person. Try to try to make it sound like this was written for them, right? Um, you can modify your canned responses, but uh, you know, you do want to keep it personal because you want this one-on-one -on -one communication. You have the ability to change in and change your perception. Yeah, 100%, yep, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so make it personal. Okay, let's move on, what's the next one? Right, keep it short and take it offline. Um, so in one of the fundamental best practices when it comes to responding to any review that's either neutral or negative in nature is to thank them for leaving that feedback and then to ask them to take it offline. And you saw Jeremy's example earlier with that negative uh, example that he sent where he did exactly that, where it had the director's phone number and um, uh, asking them, hey, I wanna make this right with you. Please give me a call on this phone number. That is 100% best practices. The last thing that you wanna do is to try and resolve something, a negative review or negative customer experience in a public forum online with everybody else. That is never going to work out for the best for you as a business. And what I've seen with customers that have been able to do this, I'm gonna give you one quick example. Um, I don't know why automotive is always uh, top of mind for me today, but um, it happens to be. So I'll do an automotive example is, uh, there's one Mitsubishi dealer that I've worked with in the in the past, and he has, I believe, over 2,000 reviews now. He doesn't spam fake reviews or anything.
everything like that. These are all legitimate reviews. And he has a 1.9 star rating, or sorry, a 4.9 star rating. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you get asked, well, how is he able to do that? And when I asked him about that, first and foremost, they truly care about customer experience at this dealership. It's like amazing if you were to visit it and you were to see how they represent themselves online and, and everything else, like they have personality, they have a unique brand, they have a silly mascot like some auto dealers do, they have everything that they, they should have. But he said, I get lots of bad reviews, but I immediately within two hours of any negative review coming in, I have left a response as the owner and manager of this dealership with my cell phone number. And I say that in the public response too, saying, I am so sorry you did not have the experience that you expected. Here's my personal cell phone number. Can you please give me a call so that I, so that we can um, uh, resolve this? And he said by doing that, that's how he's been able to turn so many what were once one, two, or three star reviews into four or more likely five star reviews. Because again, with a 4.9, the vast majority of his reviews are five stars. So. Um, again, this just shows the power of taking it offline and what what how negative experiences can be transformed into positive ones. Okay, and next one is use templates. Uh, now, I'm going to do a quick disclaimer here. Reputation is a platform that allows a lot of this kind of stuff to uh, a lot of these sorts of techniques to be automated. Um, and I know Jeremy wants to share with how he's currently using this. Um, whatever you decide to do if you're trying to scale review responses there are um uh using templates using natural language processing using all of those sorts of things is incredibly important and we at reputation have what i consider the best in class tool as it relates to this um, but regardless if you hit a certain threshold and it feels overwhelming um certainly you're going to want to start looking for technologies or solutions that um, can help with automation and that's gonna um, require things like this. So Jeremy, can you talk about how you currently use templates? Yeah, I mean, that was one, actually one of the features that that drove us to reputation. Um, putting, sounds more, templates is great, right? But canned responses, right? Um, yeah, uh, we, we make sure that, you know, we have pre-written responses to all different types of questions. Uh, against all the different topics between locations, cost, the types of services, you know, ethnicity questions that we get, uh, and then we put them in multiple languages. And so it makes sure that the team is on the same page. It makes sure that we're appropriating, appropriately responding, uh, at least the foundation of our, our response is, is thought out and, you know, and, and we put our tracking URLs in there. So, you know, we're all on the same page. We're tracking this. We're using the templates. We probably could do a better job in terms of doing automated responses and, and you know i think that's an area of improvement but we do have the bandwidth at the moment to be able to personalize these and you know the ones that need to go offline go offline the ones that need to have a, a thoughtful response get those you know from an informative response so uh it's a great platform but i'm not here to sell it <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, and uh, it's it's important, but it really allows us to keep everybody on the same page, and that's yeah. uh, one of the most important parts. And I should point out, Jeremy kind of uh, noted this. There's a spectrum of automation, so um, we typically wouldn't recommend doing automatic uh, responses to reviews, especially for negative ones however um, based using natural uh, language processing and other tools like that, you can precede what a suggested response might be based on what the customer is talking about, whether it's a bad for service desk or um, service or something along those lines so that it can uh, kind of be pre-filled uh, pre out and then you can go in and make it a little bit more personal as we spoke about previously as well too. Okay, um, be proactive. So uh, again, this is about what this slide is referring to and what I mean by this is it goes back to how all negative feedback typically contains a kernel of truth in there. So, uh, and Jeremy spoke to that too about how it's, if a negative customer experience happens once, like for instance, they sent out a contact us form or they left a voicemail or they were stood up for an appointment or something and they never received feedback and they never received a cancellation. If you start seeing those things, you know, uh, <laughs> Go and go and do a little investigation. If you see what you can do to improve that customer experience, like look operationally how you can improve. There's probably like ways that you can really improve that so that those negative reviews don't come in again in the future. 
And then um, also, of course, you want to be able to uh, enlist help. Um, so you can, this is not a one person show, no single person, uh, unless you are a small business and that's uh, your, the amount of reviews coming in isn't massive, but if you are a large business, a large technology platform, or a business with multiple locations that you're in charge of managing online reputation for and managing these reviews, uh, you're gonna need some help. And uh, there's different ways to do that. At Reputation, we actually have an entire managed services team that help that allows our clients to, if they don't have internal resources, they can outsource some of that to us. Um, but there's other ways that you can go about and think about outsourcing as well too. Jeremy, how, how do you manage like scale when it comes to this? Well, again, we're fortunate to uh, have a contact center that's open 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, holidays, Christmas, New Year's, you name it. But, but honestly, uh, it's, it's not that uh, needed, you know, to be monitoring like every second. Um, our contact center monitors our social chatter. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, organic paid ads, and we use a platform for monitoring on that. Um, you know, marketing, my team, uh, we manage certain inbox comments that maybe don't come through a platform. Uh, the one-offs, uh, you know, the platforms that may give us more of the negative reviews that need some, some hand-holding. Our Google reviews are managed by our counselors. These are the people in the field that are qualified. They meet, they understand the experience that a person has, they know the player that the person met with. Um, you know, we're not that large. Um, you know, there's, let's say, 50, 60 counselors out there that, you know, our patients are meeting with. So they all know each other, they share, you know, chats and, and phone calls together. So, um, yeah, we, we try to assign the, the right topic or the right platform to the re the appropriate response. If it's just clean up of, of negative, irrelevant comments, you know, we can give that to somebody that, you know, doesn't necessarily like fully understand, you know, something. I mean, everybody that we work with has been educated and knows our business, but there are different degrees of knowledge that people have. And, you know, we use reputation to send all of our HR, Indeed, Glassdoor, those types of reviews to HR. And then we have HR manage those reviews. Um, I and a few of us are copied on every single review. Our COO and our CEO, I have them get every single alert. And we do a fantastic job of managing these in real time. You know, the area of improvement, and I'm honest to be about what, you know, I wouldn't call it a shortcoming, but one of our hardships are, is that it's the aggregation of all that data across 70 locations, all right, and making sense of it and then taking action on it. We know in broad strokes where we fail, right? Um, but we're also not getting, you know, 20,000 reviews a month. And so we have to, you know, sometimes there, it may or may, you know, you gotta take everything to heart and you gotta act on it and understand. So so we use our yeah. team and our bench to, to help us with that. That's awesome. And that's another, uh, again, talking about nuggets that aren't necessarily in the slide, but another awesome takeaway that I just got there was making sure that every negative review that comes in sees its way upstream as well, too, and not just maybe to the right operations person so that uh, those that have the biggest influence on your organization uh, um, are aware of what needs to be improved as well, too. So that, that was It's not awesome. about placing blame internally, you know? I mean, if something surfaces, sure, you gotta address it, right? If there's continuity in that. But it's more about being aware and knowing again what where you can improve your business not say hey you adam you're falling short or jeremy you're falling short right it's how can we as a team succeed 100 percent, 100 percent. okay um and we're getting close to the end if there, anybody has any questions we we do have time for we should have a little bit of time at least for a couple questions in q a at the end so feel free to ask them as they uh if you have any okay uh jeremy um Fairly quickly, do you want to run through how to enable your customer support team and, and go through like this for us? Sure. Creating a playbook, a plan of attack is important. You want to know who, you know, what are your primary sources, what, uh, you know, who can handle them, where you can divide up the responsibilities, whether that's outsourced, insourced. Uh, it, like Adam said, it's not a, a one-person job. It can be but it would be a full-time job. I mean, you know, and there are companies that dedicate resources to that. 
uh, we just divide it up and we have the appropriate person handle it. You want to know uh, what type of response, what you're, what you're willing to do, how you're going to handle it, and what your escalation process is going to be. So you've got your pre-approved templates for the replies, you've got your process, who handles what and where it should it go, and all the team members should be aware of that, right? So, hey, I'm going to be sending these to you, or, you know, they know that they're getting it. Um, ideally, you set up these automations in real time and everybody handles it uh, accordingly. Um, if there's a way to set up a checks and balance, that's great. But you want, what you really want to know is that negative customer feedback is getting addressed and positive customer feedback is getting praised. Okay? You look for trends, you learn. You digest and learn. That's the hardest part of this whole thing. The daily responses is easy. The trends and the implementation, that's the, that's the hard part. Seriously, it really is, because that involves you taking a look at your business, owning up to it, and making those internal changes. Um, and surface the noise, right? That's what we just said. And here's one that uh, that's not there, right, is crisis planning. Um, you know, what do you do when a crisis occurs, when something real transpires? Um, something gets legs, something that gets in the news, something that terrible happens, and it goes, right? And so you might not be able to plan in advance for that, but you definitely should know, do I contact a PR agency and who is that going to be? Do I, if I'm running advertising, do I need to take that down? Do I need to sit quiet? Do we need to regroup internally? Do we need a, pu a public statement? Um, and so, uh, again, there's different levels of that that you may not expect. And honestly, knock on wood, uh, we haven't had to deal with. Um, but uh, I think, you know, you should have a plan for that as well. And we do, we do, we we know who we were going to call when you know Ghostbusters, okay? <laughs> um, the, uh, you don't have the Marshmallow Man unhappy with any procedure that they had at at Bosley. Yeah. <laughs> you know, business should be easy, right? We're all here because we care, because we love what we do, because we love our patients or our businesses, and we sell a good product, right? And so ultimately, business should be easy, and we should be able to get positive reviews. And so. If you can't, or if it's all negative, you really need to stop, take that internal look at yourself and say, what are we doing wrong? And you gotta encourage, uh, I hope I don't steal anything from you, but that silent majority, there's lots of satisfied customers out there that don't po post publicly, and you've gotta create a, a, a method for them to voice their opinion. And yep. that's the most important thing. If you wanna get positive and or negative reviews, you must surface it and get that out there. And I'll say first name, Andrew once said to me, but the only solution for pollution, meaning negative reviews, is dilution, right? So negative <laughs> reviews are gonna happen, but just drown them out, guys. We're here, it's not hard to get positive reviews, drown them out. That's great, that's a that's a, a great a great expression. Uh, the only solution for pollution is dilution. Uh, and. Yeah, that goes into the power of review requesting, which is uh, certainly something that we're big proponents of here at Reputation as well, too. Okay, um, I'm gonna wrap things up here and uh, just go, uh, I'm gonna take uh, this slide and the next one, um, and then um, we're gonna have a few minutes for questions. So again, if you have any questions, by all means ask. I think we've gotten a couple in already. Um, but really, I wanted to just circle back, which is, uh, and Jeremy just said this so eloquently, which is take that feedback to heart. Make sure that as that feedback's coming in, that you are doing something with it because the benefits of that are transformational for you as an organization. And I have one really um, great example of this within healthcare. We have a client that's a major healthcare system, like multiple ministries across different states and so on. And at one of their hospital campus locations, they opened up a new building. And uh, when that new building opened up, they had a few uh, businesses, like new businesses uh, put in there, like I think, believe it was a radiology clinic. Um, so new Google My Business listings were created and, um, and they launched and they opened and all of a sudden the reviews started trickling in uh, for this new business and they were all two stars, uh, two, three stars. And they just, this was very unusual considering their average star rating for other similar locations at both that hospital um, as well as similar clinics at other hospitals uh, were in the four range, like high threes, low four range. Um, and so they started doing some investigation and what they realized was that, that people in the negative reviews 
were complaining that they didn't know how to find the parking lot. Like there was, they just had no idea where to park and how to get to the front door of this building, um, this new building that just opened. So within two to three weeks of this building opening, um, they were able, this healthcare system, because they were monitoring all of their reviews, they were uh, responding quickly, they were taking that feedback to heart, they were like looking for ways to improve their business by this negative reviews coming in, looking for those kernels of truth. They quickly were able to create and install all, um, signage that allowed people to uh, go in and find where to park much more easily and then once they're parked how to get to the front door and suddenly their star rating average went way up and in addition they were able to get some of those previous bad reviews to switch to uh, positive ones because they were able to address those concerns and show that so that's just again one example of many that I've come across here um, and it really just goes to show the power of, of, uh, of reviews and negative feedback and what you can do with it. Okay, uh, we have more information here. If you want to contact uh, uh, myself or anybody, you can contact me at Reputation. If you want to get in touch with Jeremy at the beginning of the presentation, his LinkedIn was there. Please reach out to him as well too. And this um, also is in line with the article that we recently published on the Reputation blog called Eight Tips for Responding to Negative Reviews. By all means, feel free to uh, visit that as well too. You can also Google for that article and you'll be able to find it easily enough. All right, and we are at the Q&A. I'm wondering if there's any questions that have come in. Hey guys, uh, yeah, we have a lot of questions coming in from our audience. This is fantastic. Um, before we dive into questions, I wanna remind everyone that now's the time to get that straight from the source insight from Adam and Jeremy. Again, great questions, make a great webinar, so don't forget to submit those as we keep going. We're gonna try to get to as many as we can, um, but we do understand if we need to run. Um, don't worry though, today's session is being recorded and it will be emailed to you in the next 48 hours, so don't worry about that. Um, so I wanna to get to a lot of great questions here. This one sticks out to me, this one's from Paige. Um, you had talked a little bit about how it could be possible to delete comments, but she's asking, do you find deleting negative comments causes people to comment even more on your posts? Um, and is that kind of like a tricky situation to navigate? Sure. Uh, I think in social media, you know, you're paying for these ads, right? So this is your space to put your message. It's a tricky one. I mean, you want authentic dialogue, absolutely. But... <laughs> You know, if it's a customer experience, we leave it. If it's uh, just negativity in general, um, yeah, that's a, that. You know, we handle every one of those on a one by one basis. We don't hide all negative, negative, uh, you know, destructive or you know comments. Um, but it is your right to, and that ability does exist. I guess I'll leave it up to the organization to determine what's appropriate. But again, where you can provide color information and try to make something of that lead by making beneficial statements, uh, do it. Um, if it's innocent banter, sharing, you know, just because, hey, I'm going to share it with Jeremy because he's bald, you know, um, that's fine, right? That's funny. There's a lot of funny stuff and that just helps spread the word. Again, if it's, you know, negative, uh, you got to see if you can make it into a positive at the end of it. Yeah. But it's your right. You're paying for that ad, honestly. Um, yeah, yeah. I would, I would, um, uh, I'd only add that it's, <laughs> uh, if a negative comment comes in, even on an ad, ideally you want to try and make that a positive. You want to try and turn that person around. Again, if it's funny, like by all means, uh, go with it and run with it. That actually shows your humanity as an organization and how you have a sense of humor and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, typically, it's unusual unless somebody has a huge vendetta for them to just continue going after you over and over again. Should you delete one comment? More often than not, they don't even recognize, they don't notice that it's deleted, um, but you gotta figure out what's best for you in each case. Sometimes, just one more thing, sometimes there's, you have no choice but to delete comments due to HIPAA, uh, um, uh, like for instance, like HIPAA regulations or PHI concerns and, and things like that or defamatory stuff. So sometimes you have every right to, to remove comments and you shouldn't hesitate in those instances. That's correct. Yep. Excellent, that's a fantastic answer. Um, I have another question here from Maria that I wanna combine with another question that we have. Um, Maria's wondering, um, 
if this question, would you refer to a friend or would you refer this to a friend, uh, should be part of your survey. Um, and also another, another question that we have here is, how do we get your customers to respond to surveys? Because that can be kind of a minefield at times. Um, NPS score, uh, I think it's important. You know, the question has been around for a while. I still think it's very important. You know, everybody has their own opinion on that. But, you know, would you send your best friend there, a family member, a colleague? I think that says something about, uh, you know, the experience you had, right? Would you refer that? So um, uh, you said, should that be included? For us, we include it every single time, as well as a star rating in our surveys. And, you know, email. Email deliverability is a problem for everybody. So we first and foremost send our, our communication um, we have opt-out lists and, and track all that and respect our, our TCPA guidelines, but we use text messaging first and foremost and followed by email. Um, and, you know, we try to tell our counselors and people that, you know, we meet with in the office that uh, we're going to send you a survey. Uh, it would be beneficial if, if you could help us by providing feedback. Yeah, I'm going to um, just add a couple things uh, real quick. Um, when it comes to increasing survey responses, text messaging can be very helpful, as well as uh, using conversational text messaging as well, too, so that you are uh, maybe asking a series of questions that are really easy on a scale of, can you type up? Uh, just respond uh, one through five, how was your experience today? Um, if you send that through text messages, you can often improve the amount of responses that you get as well too. And of course, at the end of any survey, uh, especially positive ones, would you like to share this with a friend of yours? 100%, yes, you definitely would want to do that. So there's some businesses that up for, oh, sorry, there's some businesses up for just a simple, would you recommend, you know, and where it is, and they'll follow up with the negative ones. Like if it's a survey, it's your database. You know who this person is, you know their contact information, you could always follow up and get all, more information. So if you're trying to increase your response, a shorter survey oftentimes works, or just a simple NPS question or a star rating question, and then follow up if you need to get you know, more information about their negative experience. Fantastic practical advice there. Unfortunately, we're running a little bit over time. There's a lot of great questions that we're not able to get to. If we haven't gotten to your question, please feel free to reach out to Jeremy and or Adam to ask. Um, they, they would be more than receptive to that. Um, I Unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but I, I hope you all had half as much fun as I did. I want to thank again our sponsor, Reputation, our wonderful speakers here, Adam Dorfman, Jeremy Schubitz, and to thank all of you for attending. Um, so thank you and have a a great rest of your week. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you very much.